Hello and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place where we share creative and inspiring learning in our schools. Season 4, Episode 59. Hello and welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast with me, Mark Taylor. Today I'm joined by Liz Webb, who's the Partnerships Manager for Symphonia. And Symphonia is a networked notation for tomorrow's orchestra, which basically means it replaces um, traditional sort of paper scores in music with a digital system that synchronises the beat of the conductor um, to the musicians and the type of music which is then used on a, on a tablet. So welcome, Liz, and thanks very much for joining me. Pleasure. Um, so can you give us a little bit of background about, well, first of all, sort of what Symphonia is and, and, and sort of how its inception first worked and then your, your, your position within it? Um, yes, Symphonia, um, the idea for Symphonia uh, came from composer Ed Hughes, um, who's also a professor of composition at the University of Sussex. Um, he and I were helping out at our local primary school orchestra, um, Southover School in Lewis. Um, and uh, we were there every week um, playing the piano and playing different instruments and helping the kids. Um, and uh, we noticed that children get lost all the time in orchestra and they find it very upsetting and very stressful. And we watched children in what was a, a very encouraging atmosphere get upset and cry. Um, and Ed started thinking, was there something that he could do with technology to improve this? Um, and that's the that's the, the fundamental idea of Symphonia, um, was to help children to enjoy playing in, in orchestras and take away the stress of worrying about getting lost. That's brilliant. And um, and I've seen on your website, um, you've got some clips of, of orchestras and things actually using it. Um, but it's really nice to hear that the 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 whole inception and the whole idea started in a school and and I think especially for our listeners as well I think they can relate to that when you have an ensemble or when you're trying to do some music together once it comes to actually reading music it is that support network that you need and it sounds like this really is a an integral way of being able to do that in in the modern world yes very much so uh, and we found that there were there were um, kids who were musically really talented. Um, and could play their instruments really well and would, were more than capable of playing the parts that were in front of them um, in terms of their technique and the fingerings that they knew. Um, but they were really struggling with that early stages of reading music and just the just the geography of the of the piece, um, working out where they were. Um, and they'd get they get put off really quickly um, and they 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 just lose their place and then they'd be out for the rest of the of the piece. Um, and so. We wanted to develop a system to enable the piece to carry on and that kids could maybe miss out a few bars if there was something they couldn't play or something they just just messed up on as a one off, not be put off, not stop, but carry on playing because they knew that they would ne- they weren't going to get lost um, and also that they could just try again next time. I really like that and I, I know from personal experience when I was a very young musician at school um, all the way through to even slightly older, it's... The, the comfort zone is really important, isn't it? And when you've got to the point, you've done all that preparation and that lead up work within a school to get kids enthused, to, to give them the training they need and you get them into an ensemble. Um, and it's then suddenly a different feel for them. So I think that supportiveness of knowing that actually it just takes away a little bit of the fear factor because you always know where you are. Um, I, I think it's a great idea. So can you tell us a little bit more from having come up with such a sort of a positive starting point and, and a really sort of um, sort of a supportive emotional point really for the children? How did it then develop from that idea into a, a, a practical project in, and, and the people that were then involved to get it to become a reality? Um, well, Ed Hughes, um, as well as being a composer, um, he at the University of Sussex and um, works with lots of colleagues who are heavily involved in coding and programming um, and he has access to to um, uh, lots of very talented people there um, and so um, once he's had the idea he was then able to put a team together um, to actually make it reality um, he had this idea of, of using tablets because they are um, very widely used in schools um, and um, and it's a, a it's a portable, practical way of uh, of implementing this this system. Does it actually can it be used on any tablet, or is it particularly an iPad, or or does it? Um, I'm just sort of thinking in terms of schools having different types of tablets that they can use. Does it sort of work across a, a diverse amount of devices? 
There are two apps. There's a conductor app, which basically controls the perform all the performer apps. And the conductor app does have to be on an iPad, um, just simply for technical reasons that, that that's where it works. Yeah. However, the performer apps can be Android as well, and, and it can be a combination. So so you just need one iPad and everyone else can be be any tablet. Um, and they're just all, all networked together um, on a private Bluetooth system. So they all talk to each other. So you don't even need a good internet connection. Um, you just need the tablets all, all um, with their Bluetooth switched on. Right, and, and, and it is that simple. So as long, as long as you know how to enable the Bluetooth on the tablets and you know how to use the conductors app, the rest of it should kind of take care of itself. I'm just sort of thinking in terms of, of those people less technically minded who might want to use it. There's, there, there's no barrier there from a technical point of view for teachers or people within schools trying to use it. No, it should be straightforward. You can, you can just download the conductor app um, and the performer app um, uh, the conductor one is on, on the App Store. Performer app is um, App Store or, or via Amazon or, or other um, app down, downloading platforms. So, and it is, it's very quick and it's free at the moment and it's straightforward. Fabulous. So free at the moment. So is that because it's in its early stages or, or what are the plans for that sort of development? Yes, it is in its early stages. At the moment, it's completely free. Um, and the, the app comes with um, a free bundle of eight scores. Um, which are very varied. Um, they range from a, 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 a kind of beginner level arrangement of Jingle Bells um, by Ed Hughes um, up to uh, Bach's um, double concerto arranged um, for uh, flexible ensemble, uh, Bach's double violin concerto, um, which obviously has kind of virtuoso violin parts. So the idea is to give a sense of what, what the app can do um, across a, a really wide range of music. What we're working on um, is uh, the next version, um, which will include um, a paid facility to um, for users to upload their own scores. Um, they have to be in XML format um, and um, and have been originated um, in Sibelius, um, but then they, which is standard across the music industry, um, then they can upload their own scores, and that will be a paid service. Um, and also we are going to expand our score library um, and that will also be a paid service. I think that's a really good development because I know um, lots of music coordinators and lots of people who are doing ensembles within schools um, they have to do their own arranging anyway because they've got various different types of musicians in their ensemble it's not a, a sort of a one a one style fits all kind of thing so and most of those people like you say will be using on Sibelius at that point anyway so to be able to then upload it directly would would well one saves all the all the printing and all of that kind of thing but uh, sort of just very very simply having done the arrangement which they would have been doing already then you can just use directly into the new program i think that's absolutely fantastic so in in terms of who it's who it's for them you said it sort of started in in primary school there um has how's it developed in terms of other people using it uh, is it sort of gone into secondary schools and, and other orchestras as well yeah, we've we've tested it quite extensively um, with a wide range of of, of users. Um, it works particularly well, we think, with age nine to thirteen kids um, who are just at the very beginning stages of using notation, um, and partly because they are changing their level all the time. And one of the real strengths of Symphonia is that you can have lots of different parts of different levels on the system, and each performer. Um, has their tablet in front of them and at any point they can scroll through all the available parts um, and change which part they're playing so for example if you have a beginner violinist at the beginning of the term they might play the easy violin part but they might um, learn a whole load of new fingerings and a load of new notes and, and it's getting a bit easy by the end of the term um, so they can say well I'm going to try the medium violin part um, or the hard violin part and they can scroll and, and play that part as well or instead I see. And and are you able to use these different parts away from the ensemble itself? So um, are they sort of then stored in the app or does it always have to be connected to the iPad originally? I'm just thinking of children having their own pads, which they might then want to practice on at home. Yes. And that's something that we're working on, because at the moment, the, all the performer apps are completely controlled by the conductor app. So once the conductor app is, is switched on and is fed through to the con, con, to the performer tablets, um, what before the piece has actually started, um, you can scroll through your part and have a look and you know find the difficult bits and 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 uh, ask about things you don't know and that kind of thing. Um, 
but um, once the tablet is away from the the the, the kind of 30 meter area around the conductor app um, you can't look at it that's something we're look, looking at for the next version um, and we're looking at the option of, of having um, accompanying PDFs um, which people can use on their tablets yeah that, that would make a lot of sense wouldn't it like you say because then you've got that being able to practice at home as well as together and uh, and the, the, the other thing I like is that um, the, the one thing we know about having music is that a lot of it can either get lost or it can get um, very easily misplaced or not brought in for a rehearsal so so that sort of gets rid of all of that doesn't it you know that when you sit down and you're going to start your rehearsal you've actually got everything that you need all in one place yeah and that was another big motivation for the for the way we developed the app um, is seeing how much time was was wasted on on uh, from the teacher's point of view of of having to sort out the music at the beginning and the end of every rehearsal um, and actually the kids um, physically having to you know, fetch their music or um, make sure they have the right part or, or not having the right one or it falling off or all those things. Um, and, and it just um, gives much more time for the music. And you talk there about music falling off and that kind of thing. Is Did you find, has that been a problem having a, a tablet on a music stand? Um, I guess because then I guess people may be worried about the fact that if, if, a, if a tablet falls off a music stand, the screen might break or something like that. So how has that been um, part of your research and part of the development? Yes, well, we, we, um, we do have a, a set of, of, of um, iPad stands, um, which we've used um, successfully in, in, in our various workshops um, across, um, in different places like the Brighton Science Festival and the Brighton with Brighton Early Music Festival Community Choir and things, we've used them for that. Um, but we realise that schools aren't going to have sets of, uh, or are unlikely to have sets of, of iPad um, music stands. They do actually, they actually sit fine on on solid music stands. Um, uh, we, uh, of course, there is a danger of of dropping them. That is a that is you know inevitable. That's going to happen sometimes. Um, uh, we found that electrical tape works really well. That you can just stick a bit of electrical tape um, on the edge of the tablet just to just to, to keep them a bit steadier. But if you've got if you've got solid music stands, then then they they just sit sit like any piece of music. I think that's a fantastic hack. The, uh, the electrical tape that's a great idea. <laughs> I think that, that's true for anybody as well. It also like it also means that you don't necessarily have to go out and buy expensive casing and all that because of course there are casing for tablets that you can do yeah. which are almost sort of foolproof in terms of throwing them around. But um, I think all those things and all those ideas are really helpful for teachers, especially as you're starting to get going and making it sort of getting all these things up together. So you talked about it being used in in the Brighton Festival. What sort of um, organisations have used it and what sort of performance elements have actually already taken part? Um, well, we've already had, um, we, we thought we'd try it, with, try it out with singers, um, which was really interesting because even if you're a, a, an absolute beginner violinist, if you're, if you're playing a, a simple part, um, it's basically open strings. And if you know where you are um, because you're using Symphonia, um, then you're, you're pretty much going to play the right notes. You know, there's a good chance um, and it will sound, sound okay. But singers don't have that um, because they have to find the notes out of thin air. So, so um, that was a whole whole interesting extra angle that we wanted mm-hmm. to explore um, and to see how um, inexperienced music readers who were singers um, got on with it. And it was um, it actually worked really well. They still obviously had to be given their note from some by someone else. Um, so you need need to have a more experienced person there to to just give people their notes. Um, but they, the feedback that we had, they definitely felt that the, the initial um, note learning, note bashing stage um, was much quicker. Um, and again, it meant that they could get into the, into the um, more interesting um, interpretive side of the music much more quickly. And that's really important, isn't it, for keeping, you know, keeping the interest in and, and like I say, that movement of development to get get away from the technical stuff as soon as you can to be able to really get into the into the music and start to bring it together, I think, is a, is a really yeah. important feature there. Um, so in terms of how it practically works, um, so when you, you, you first sit down and, and, you, and you open the app up, um, in terms of looking at the music, are there sort of different um, visual things that you can do? Obviously, when you'd normally have a piece of music, you'd see a whole page in one go. So how, how does it actually physically look to the person reading the music? Well, the conductor um, has a choice. Um, they get the whole score, um, like a full score. Um, but, of course, the screens are relatively small. Um, and so... Um, a full score if you've got lots of parts is a bit of a squish and it's quite hard to read inevitably 
Um, and so there's an option when you can um, just have uh, half, say, half of the score visible instead of the whole 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 lot. So there's just a, a zoom in and out function on the conductor app. Um, on the performer apps, um, you can't change the way it looks. But um, this was uh, another thing that came out from testing it with the South Haver Orchestra, that you 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 generally you get about four or five lines of music um, on your screen. So you can look ahead. Um, what we found was that when the, the pages turned within the app, um, it was very disconcerting because people actually look ahead, especially more experienced musicians look ahead all the time um, when they're playing. And we hadn't quite realised how much people do that until that option wasn't there. So what we've done is at the bottom of each page, there's a shaded line of music. And that's the line of music that's going to come up on the next page. So you can look ahead and you've got a sense of what's coming and then you get that on the next page. Well, that's fantastic. And and I think that'd be a really interesting thing. I mean, as, as a professional musician myself, to actually you do a lot of these things automatically, especially as you get more experience. And to actually mm. have, have a real in-depth thought process about how that works, I, I can find, I can imagine that's really interesting to actually see how the concept and the, and the brain pattern works in terms of that looking ahead and seeing forward. And, and I can imagine exactly what you came up against was that, that when you don't know what's around the corner, then that really is a problem. And I, and I have that as a, as a player myself. You know, when you get to the end of a piece of, of an actual page of a piece of music, if you haven't done it very often or you don't know what's on the next page, that is slightly disconcerting. So to, I think to have that feature at the bottom sounds like a really great idea. Um, so in terms of the, you said about the highlighting and that kind of thing. So basically, as each bar goes by, the, the actual bar that the musicians need to play, that's exactly what they see. And it just moves seamlessly as you continue through the music. Yes. Yeah, so it's a block. It's a green block and it highlights the bar um, that you're actually playing. And then there's an option. Um, so you can have every beat highlighted um, with a little little grey blob that goes on each beat. Um, or you can choose not to have that. So for you know, for absolute beginner um, you know, grades one to three, say, um, kids, they're going to probably want, the, want it on every beat. Um, but for more advanced players, they probably won't. So how exactly does it work in terms of the page actually turning? Is it literally um, like on, on some of the apps you can get on tablets, it looks like the page is physically folding onto the next one? Or, or does it change much faster than that? How does it's, it actually it's, mu- it's much faster than that, yeah. It's just an instant onto the next page. And um, and how have people responded to that? Have they? Um, is it just something you get used to, um, and then you you forget about the fact that it's happening, or, or do people find that um, supportive or, or disconcerting? Have you had any feedback from that? I think uh, we have we have done um, uh, a couple of events with um, a, a group of professional players, um, and that was really interesting because it was the same players twice. Um, so they had a real kind of getting used to it uh, session, which was actually the press launch for when we launched the launched the app. Um, and then we performed um, at uh, as a demonstration um, during a dur- at the Sussex Innovation Centre, who've been supporting this stage of the development of the project. And uh, they the page turning was was fine. No, they they didn't seem to have a problem with that at all. I have to say, um, I I first saw this when I was in Manchester for the Music in, and Drama Expo, and and it looks very natural. And and I think the supportiveness for the for the younger children and actually seeing the bars move is is great. But I think also as a more experienced person, you can you can really I think because like you say, you've got four lines and the fact that you can see ahead enough, it actually it works inc- incredibly well. Um, so. In terms of people being able to experience it themselves before they might want to download it, is there anywhere they can they can go is it on the website or anywhere that they can actually physically go and see how it works in practice before they might want to get involved? Um, well, the website is is um, has a comprehensive user guide um, with quite a lot of screenshots, so you get quite a good sense of it from that. Um, but I mean, the app the plan is that the app will will, will remain free um, and our free bundle of scores will remain free um, and it's so quick and easy to download the easiest thing is to just do that and then ha- and have a play around and how many people were involved in the overall development of it when when you when it sort of was going through the university was it um sort of i guess department by department until it was fully fully designed i mean how many sort of people did it actually take to actually develop it fully i guess the core team um in terms of the development was ed hughes who's been leading on the on the artistic side um, and then Alice Eldridge and Chris Kiefer, who are both um, part of the music department, um, and they were very involved in the um, c- 
coordinating the the coding and the programming um and uh, and then we brought in a programmer Libby McCallum um who is still working um on upgrading and um, getting ready for the next version and I guess that's the thing isn't it I mean I've developed an app myself and it is that it's that continual um upgrade that you need partly is um the platforms just do general updates so you need to keep on top of that don't you but like I say when you're when you're improving it and you've got new features and new ideas all of that just takes continual work yes that's right um how many people have you got using it at the moment have you got any figures of the type of sort of the numbers of people that are already really enjoying it um well we've we know that we've we've had about um 60 downloads um but they that's been all over um you know quite widely spread around the world we've we've had quite a few people in australia because there was a really good um australian radio broadcast public radio broadcast i guess i mean that brings up the question of course it, it it's not a necessarily a uk thing is it it can be anywhere because once you you've got the scores like you say that are already integral to it but because you'll be able to in the next um incarnation upload your own things i mean there is there are no boundaries really as long as you've got access to itunes and the platforms to download it it could be used anywhere in the world absolutely yes and that's that that's the beauty of of music notation of course is that it's a it's an international language and if you've got any ideas of where where you'd like to take it i mean would would you like to see it in every school i mean do you think it has that sort of possibility as people um get more of fay with using technology and music i think it does yes and what i really like about it is the the way that you can use um expanded scores really successfully to involve um players who are at very different levels um, we've commissioned Ian McRae, who's a who's a primary school head, but also um, a very fine and experienced musician um, and conductor. And he's um, been doing more arrangements for us. And he's been doing them in the, the kind of standard school orchestra format, um, which is basically a kind of SATB parts, um, but then written out for all the key instrument groups. So there'll be a part in E flat for a saxophone, there'll be a part in F for a horn, um, but there'll also be a, a color coded part um, using the Boomwacker um, colour scheme uh, so that um, uh, kids who don't play any instruments at all um, but would like to join in um, can do so um, using Boomwackers or other colour-coated percussion. Um, but at the other end, you can have kids who are, or, or adults equally, um, who are really quite advanced um, playing the more advanced parts. I really like the fact that there's that sort of gradual... Um... I guess sort of a gradual um, slide of being able to get involved in all of that, isn't it? You, you don't have that. Now we're reading music. Here's a piece that's already pre-existing. That I think that sort of easing in in terms of, like you say, being able to use percussion or boomwhackers, and and also then, like you say, the amount of difficulty within each part and that within the ensemble. I think that flexibility, I think, is is incredibly important and very um, forward thinking. And I think that's very helpful for schools generally. And um, and I, and I think that's probably the most supportive thing um, from a, a musical point of view. But the other part, um, I wonder how you've had any feedback in terms of the fact actually using pads and technology within the curriculum. Because, of course, what it does is it, it broadens that sort of cross-curricular idea of actually having technology as actually an integral part of what you're trying to produce within a school. Yeah, um, certainly it, it's, it ticks boxes from teacher's point of view. Um, and it, it's a, a very... A positive and inclusive way of using that technology. Um, a lot of schools um, have 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 got funding to actually buy the iPads, um, and it's great to have something that's that's really inclusive that they can they can do with them. And just before we started recording, you mentioned that you were going to be an, in London um, in February. Can you tell us a, a little bit about about that and what people can expect to see if they come and see you there? Um, yes, that's right. We're going to be at the uh, Music and Drama um, exhibition. Um, at Olympia, it's on the 22nd and 23rd of February. Um, we've got a um, a stand there. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, five um, performer iPads um, and a conduct- conductor iPad, um, and um, people can basically come along and have a go. You can use the conductor app um, and and have a go at actually um, experimenting with um, with beating. The way the conductor app works is that you you beat two bars worth of the time signature, whatever that is, at whatever speed you want, um, at a steady speed, and they, the app will then pick up that speed and carry on at that steady speed. Um, and so if you want your piece to be metronomic because you're, you're working with kids and that's what they need, um, then you can do that. But 
if you want to be more subtle or you want to have an, a, a cellarando or um, or, uh, or slow down, then you can keep tapping um, and gradually um, you can you can do that um, and the app will pick up your your decreasing or increasing speed. Um, so you can be much more subtle. So the conductor app is something that you can you can learn um, to use. And when you're actually there, uh, have you got any people of um, have you got any instruments there that people can actually play with as well? I just wonder if that sort of practical um, idea that we said in terms of actually physically using it as a performer as well is that something you're able to provide? That's not something we thought of, but that's a good idea. I'll look into that. <laughs> Fabulous. So um, for all those people that are listening and thinking, I need to really um, have a look at this and see, what, what's the best place for them to go and check it out? What's the, the website address and, and where can they find it? The website address is www.synchphonia.co.uk. Fabulous, and and from there you can you can get everything you need, and you can see all of those um, all those options and the features. And I, and I know there's some great videos there of show, showing people actually using it already. And if you go to educationonfire.com and go to Syncphonia in the search bar, I'll make sure that all manner of social media and um, places where you can find it on iTunes and all that are all listed as well. So you can go there and and find everything that you need and and check it out. So, Liz, um, thank you so much for chatting to me. It's really interesting. I think it's a really important development that will really help many schools. And, and I love the fact that it's it's pushing the boundaries and doing something which is integral, integrally important as a, as a musician and just taking it into the 21st century and beyond. Thanks very much. Great talking to you. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.